Thank you, uh, the organizers of this meeting. And thank you, Dario, for trying to pronounce my name in Rashagulla way. <laughs> and uh, yeah, so this talk is going to be extremely simple. I mean, it's probably the simplest talk of this uh, meeting. It uh, is uh, that simple that even I will understand this talk. OK, so it's going to be extremely simple. So uh, first of all, this is a dishonest attempt to sell the work by saying I'm doing conservative perturbation theory for non-conservative systems. What I mean by conservative here is just the canonical perturbation theory. And because it's canonical perturbation theory done for non-conservative systems, so uh, in this talk, I will not go into technicalities because those of you, uh, those of um, who, who present here are already aware of canonical perturbation theory. I mean, the thing is going, the techniques are going to be very trivial. And for those of you, who are not aware of canonical perturbation theory, it's not possible for me to explain it in uh, 15 minutes or 30 minutes. But I'll tell you the main idea behind the work, and I'm going to tell you what exactly uh, you know, started this work. So Tirth and Kedar, we are uh, summer students at IIT Kanpur, and Rohit Ashwa is uh, uh, doing PhD with me. So, Everything started with a very innocent question, which probably you had already asked yourself at some point of time or other. I'm very intrigued, intrigued by limit cycles. So the question which I was asking was, if I know when you have a simple harmonic oscillator, in classical picture in phase space, you have non-isolated set of uh, closed trajectories. And when you quantize it, you get countable number of infinite close, uh, uh, countable um, uh, in number of infinite states, and that's how the quantization works uh, when you do it on a system which has a center type fixed point and you have oscillations around it. Okay. And because this limit cycle is very interesting feature in nonlinear dynamical systems where you have an asymptotically stable state in the phase space where wherever you start in the basin of attraction, it goes and converges on a stable limit cycle, so the question now which I was trying to ask myself was, what happens if to begin with, classically, I have a single isolated closed orbit in the phase space? What happens if I try to quantize it? Okay. I mean, I don't even know whether quantizing it has a meaning or not. I mean, formalism wise, what does it even mean? But this was, I thought it's a nice question to ask. And immediately I realized, I mean, this is, of course, a nonlinear problem because limit cycles can only appear in nonlinear dynamical systems, and of course, because it has to be dissipative, because attractors cannot exist in a system which has conserved quantities. So in Hamilton systems, I cannot get a limit cycle. That means this kind of system which possesses limit cycle does not have a Hamilton. Okay. And I know, well, the basic quantum mechanics tells me if I were to write down Schrodinger equation, I will start with a Hamiltonian, right? So what to do now? So at this point, I understood, okay, I mean, this problem is going to be tough. Let me ask a simpler question. Can I at least write down the Hamilton in some way? Okay. Little bit of literature survey told me that for damn simple harmonic oscillator, there happens to be a way, I mean, there are many ways actually, uh, at least two or three that I know of, uh, that you can actually extend the damn simple harmonic oscillator by adding to this, uh, by extending this two-dimensional system uh, effectively a four-dimensional system by adding an auxiliary equation, which is called the dual equation. But you see, there is no coupling between them, but still you can manage to write down a Lagrangian for it. Okay? And once you have Lagrangian, and uh, then you, I mean, go on to define the Hamiltonian by doing all the standard tricks. Okay? Now, just to stress again, this was done by Bateman. This is called the Bateman, uh, Bateman Hamiltonian. Just to stress again, just note, there is no coupling between these two equations. Okay. But you still got a Hamiltonian where if you now, you know, you can do um, uh, action principle if you wish, or you can uh, just write down the canonical equations of motion, you will end up getting these two equations. This is not very surprising because if you put lambda equal to zero, that would mean you are back to a proper simple harmonic oscillator. And this will also become a simple harmonic oscillator that would mean that this system is effectively now a two-dimensional isotropic uh, simple harmonic oscillator. And then there should exist another Hamiltonian here. And then this is a bit surprising that this Hamiltonian, after putting lambda equal to zero, is not coming out as you know, kinetic energy plus potential energy kind of term. 
But that's not surprising because we know that for two-dimensional harmonic oscillator, isotropic harmonic oscillator, you have what is known as Fratkin tensor, which is conserved. Okay? So this is just one of the elements of the Fratkin tensor, which is conserved. And you can use this to actually get back the, just, the, uh, the, just the part with lambda put to zero. You can use this to get back the standard um, uh, equations for uh, isotropic simple harmonic oscillator, not even damp. In that sense, I mean, you see, this, the, the Hamiltonian which we usually write, kinetic energy plus potential energy, is not quite unique for certain systems. You can write other Hamiltonians also. Okay. There may be associated problems for boundedness, this and that, but it works. You get the, get the equation of motion. That's what I'm after. And this, I mean, just to put it in context with the existing literature, this Hamiltonian uh, can be shown to be equivalent to what is known as calderola canai Hamiltonian, which happens to be time-dependent Hamiltonian by a series of canonical uh, transformations. Okay, so this Hamiltonian you can also use, and you can just use x dot equal to minus del h del p, et cetera, et cetera. You will get back this. But this is time dependent, so I'm not really interested with that. I want to work with the time independent uh, Hamiltonian. But this has been done. This is for simple harmonic oscillator. Okay? And how did Bateman came up with this Hamiltonian? Well, it was almost trial and error. I say almost because I don't know what was going on in his mind. I mean, if I were to sit down and calculate, it's probably trial and error for me. There's no general technique. So then I thought, can I generalize this and somehow get a Hamiltonian for Van der Poel oscillator? Okay, because now uh, I will have a Hamiltonian, and then maybe I can do some quantum mechanics around it and make sense out of it. So this is the Van der Poel oscillator. So this is a, the, the Van der Poel oscillator belongs to the general class of systems known as Leonard uh, equation, where x double dot plus epsilon fx x dot, x dot plus gx, where, I mean, uh, these are nice functions. I'm not being mathematically rigorous, they're nice enough functions. And one knows that these kind of systems, when uh, they uh, satisfy what is known as Leonard, Leonard's theorem, they are capable of showing limit cycle behavior. Van der Poel oscillator happens to be such an oscillator where this, the form of f and g is such that you get uh, a limit cycle in the phase space with radius 2 if epsilon happens to be very, very small. So these are just the limit cycles that I've drawn in the phase space of Van der Poel oscillator, where this axis is x, this is x dot or y. Okay. And you've got limit cycles. When epsilon is very small, it's a nice circle of radius 2. Okay. And, uh, and the, the, these, these are textbook stuff. Now, can I use this, use the technique that I discussed in the earlier slide, can I use that and somehow write down the Hamiltonian? And as I told you, it's trial and error. Okay. So then, I extended the Van der Poel oscillator by writing a dual equation. But now note, although they are not uncoupled, the coupling is only one way. So Van der Poel oscillator, is there, and the auxiliary Van der Poel equation is being sort of forced by Van der Poel oscillator, but there is no back coupling. There is no feed, uh, the feedback going the other direction. So in that sense, it's a pretty safe thing. So it's like that this equation is acting as a heat bath for Van der Poel oscillator. So whatever um, I mean uh, is dissipated out there is sort of getting into it. Okay. So then it was trial and error, and ultimately the Lagrangian which I could come up with was look this, and then you can come up with a Hamiltonian, which was actually much worse when I uh, found it for the first time. But then I did some canonical transformations and all, and this was the simplest possible looking Hamiltonian you can come up with for the dual system. Okay? But the good thing I want to stress again is that this and this, they only have one-way coupling. That's the most important part here. I don't want Van der Poel equation to get corrupted, because that's my interest. And uh, very recently, there was a paper in uh, PRL in uh, 2013 where uh, the title of the paper is conservative. Uh, uh, title of the paper is um, classical mechanics of non non conservative systems. There, they develop a general formalism where they extend the Hamilton's principle of least action to accommodate dissipative systems and all. And what I found out that this thing, which I uh, found out by doing trial and error, is actually compatible with whatever was proposed in that paper. Okay. So now, 
this happens to be the main resolution. Okay. And now the point was I could start doing quantum mechanics with it, but before that, there was one thing I could do, which is I could do canonical perturbation theory on this system now, because now it has a conserved quantity. And can I do canonical perturbation theory and find out the frequency correction if epsilon were not very, uh, epsilon is not zero? Because the frequency uh, when epsilon is zero is going to be just omega. When uh, epsilon is turned on, the frequency is going to change. Can I find out the frequency correction? There are a plethora of methods of calculating frequency correction, but nobody has applied canonical perturbation theory to find out the frequency correction uh, of the Van der Poel oscillator, simply because Van der Poel oscillator does not have any Hamiltonian. Now that I have a Hamiltonian, can I use the trick and find that out? And that's what we did. We basically, what we did, we did series of um, uh, transformations and uh, we uh, did the standard canonical perturbation theory. Uh, you can look at the paper and you will figure the thing out. But let me stress the main point here. There's a big problem in doing canonical perturbation theory which led to CAM theory, which is the problem of small denominator. Right? So in this problem here, when you have two systems like this, this omega square and omega square are same. So those of you who are aware will immediately realize the problem of small denominator is going to come. So how to get rid of it? Well, the, here the good thing was I'm only interested in the Van der Poel oscillators uh, dynamics, not in the auxiliary Van der Poel equations dynamics. So I could choose whatever initial condition I want for the auxiliary Van der Poel equation and somehow get rid of the small denominator problem order by order. And by doing that, this formalism helped me to do canonical perturbation theory of the Van der Poel oscillator, bypass the problem small denominator, up to two orders because I could choose only two initial conditions of auxiliary Van der Poel equations independently and I could find out the uh, corrections. So uh, ultimately what we have done is we have found out the time independent Hamiltonian for Van der Poel oscillator. We have performed canonical perturbation theory on this and the auxiliary Van der Poel equation happens to be such that it helps you to bypass the problem of small denominators up to second order. If you want to go to higher orders, it's better to do Lie perturbation theory. And uh, well, the it's different from existing Hamiltonians which have been reported for Leonard systems because the existing Hamiltonians only are interested in center type oscillation. This is the first time where I'm doing Hamilton formalism for limit cycle type oscillation. And then where quantization can be done, where whether it has a meaning I'm working on. There are questions? Uh, this, uh, so when you have like one dissipative system and it, now you are uh, modeling it by two, I mean like a Hamiltonian system. So if I look at the original system, I mean then it's of course energy is going down, right? Uh, and so the other guy is kind of energy going up. Is that yeah, that would be the idea. That would be the idea. But one has to realize uh, that this Hamiltonian, which one is writing, is not actually total energy. Not total energy. From the, uh, yeah, it doesn't have a okay. oh. Are there other questions? If not, we think, yes, one question here. Square there? No. An X square. Yes, so that's why it's one uh, one way coupling. That's what, you, that's what you meant by one way. One way coupling. There's no Y here, but there is X here. Okay, thank you. There's still one minute if there is Not there. one there. <laughs> uh, so the original system was not symplectic, I guess. Uh, no, not. But is the total thing symplectic in the xx dot plane and yr dot plane independently. Total system is symplectic because there's this Hamilton structure is there. Everything then, is, the only problem is it's one way coupled, so bounded and all. But it's one way coupled. It's so one if way the coupled, original one was not uh, symplectic. Yes. How did you change the symplectic structure? Oh, by, by introducing a conserved quantity here now. So there is one more conserved quantity now. Or? No, this, this conserved quantity is such that it. Uh, is satisfied by the entire four dimensional system. And you can use uh, action principle here and find out these equations also. So the entire symplectic structure is there. I see. Okay, thanks. 
because you see, if symplectic structure were not there, I wouldn't have been able to do the canonical perturbation thing. These things are there, action angle variables are there, and but it's a little weird, Hamiltonian there. 